So hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Nolas. I am the head of data science at Saturn Cloud. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about putting R in production, which is one of my favorite R subjects, definitely top three. Um, this is stuff that I've personally used in my career, and I think it's really cool. I think it's a great topic that more people could use to know about, and I think it is more accessible than people realize. So before I go into all this R in production stuff, I'm going to do a 10 second promo for Saturn Cloud. Saturn Cloud is a cloud place location where you can deploy. It's like your data science dev environment. So you can run analyses, train models. Um, you can use four terabytes of RAM. You can use GPUs. You can host dashboards, things like that. And it all is our support. And it has like our studio built in now. Um, so we recently added full R support. I think it's super cool, especially as a primarily R user. Uh, I really like the platform, which makes sense because I work there. But I highly encourage you to check it out. End promo. And now we'll get to the regular part of the talk. So this talk is going to be two parts. The first part of the talk is an introduction to making APIs in R. So we're going to talk about what APIs are, how you do them in R, the basics. Part two is going to be how do you make these things enterprise ready? So what are all the steps between cool, you made your first API, and this is a thing that millions of customers can use at a time. So first, let's talk about making APIs in R. What is an API? What is production? What is anything? Well, what is production? We'll start there. So production, when I think of production, to me, production means making your code run so that it's customer facing and like customers can use it. So if you make an analysis that you put into a PowerPoint and you show to an executive, that is not production. But if you are making code that is, you know, once a month going to rescore all of your customers with a new model and it runs every month consistently, I would consider that production. And that would be like a scheduled task. And I think these are pretty common in data science. Like, hey, cool, you train a model. And then once a month, the engineering team runs it and rescores customer. There is another type of production, which is typically more like software engineering kind of production, which is like continuously running stuff, which is if you think about like a machine learning recommendation engine, that has to be making new recommendations for customers every time the customer does something. So if you're Netflix and someone logs in, you want to make new recommendations for what to show them the moment the customer logs in. So these kinds of production systems are continuously running. So the models that the machine learning engineers or data scientists train are always available there to use. And this code can be called at any time. Importantly, both types of these production have to continuously work without human intervention. If your code is constantly crashing, if it's breaking, uh, if you have to manually hit start each time, that's not really what I would consider production. Today, we are primarily going to be talking about the continuously running kind of production, but a lot of what we're talking about actually relates to the scheduled task kind of production too. So how do you make computer systems talk? If a software engineer is developing the Netflix UI and they want to put in recommendations, we need one UI system to talk to the recommendation system. And to do that, we use APIs. Most modern APIs use the HTTP protocol. And this blows my mind. I did not realize this for like the first 10 years of my career. Websites use the HTTP protocol, but basically all the HTTP protocol is, is sending a text message somewhere and getting text response back. So if you are in a browser and you go to www.google.com, you're sending text and Google is sending text back. And all that's happening between APIs or websites, these are all the same thing. All there are, are just, computers sending text back and forth to each other. The way you view a website with HTTP, which we should all know and love, because presumably we all view the web all the time, it's 2022, um, is you on your laptop in your favorite browser, when you go to your browser and you type in a URL like google.com, your computer is doing a GET request to some server somewhere. And then that server is going to send a response back. That response is going to be a text file with HTML in it, which turns into the web page you see. But the server is the google.com server, like it's the Google server, and the response is HTML text. That is how a web server works. works. An API server, it's basically the same idea, but instead of your browser sending the, the GET request, your computer would send it. And in the case of R, you can use the header package. And again, you're sending a GET request. You're doing the exact same thing your browser does when you go to a web page. But the server, and here, let's say we're going to myapi.com slash customer slash 21 to get information on the 21st customer. And here, the server is going to say, OK, well, looking at that route, that customer slash 21, I know you want customer 21 data. So instead of sending back a HTML web page view, I'm just going to send back a JSON blob that's just going to say, here's the age of the customer and their name and things like that. So it's the exact same thing you're used to, but you're using, uh, you're using now it's called an API. 
Um, so with the, with the hitter app in R or with any get HTTP request, there are actually multiple types. Get sends information and there just sends a, hey, I would like information on this. A post request actually sends data. So like if you want to update the customer's name, you could do a post request to that same endpoint to be like, here's the new name to use. So it's just sending data. Um, it, but what if you wanted to code the stuff on the right? What if you actually on the right wanted to run stuff? So if you wanted to run a website server yourself in R, you could use Shiny for that. And this is exactly what Shiny does. When you are in R and you hit like run Shiny app, what your R session is doing is becoming the server and your browser is sending the responses to and from that. And so R has a pretty well-known package for creating website servers to host websites for you. But what if you want to do this latter thing? What if instead of having Shiny send the response back that's a web page you can view, what if you just want to send JSON back? So you want some R code to send to data to and from, and you want your R code to host the API as opposed to hitter, which is like accessing the API. How would you do that? You would use something called Plumber. Plumber, originally developed by uh, Jeff Allen, now under the domain of RStudio. It's a great R package. Um, you can think of this as what if Shiny, but the users aren't humans, they're computers. That's what the Plumber app is for you. And the Plumber app is super easy to use. So first thing you do is you make a file and like you call it something like REST controller. And in the REST controller, you put the endpoints you want your API to have. So if you want slash sum to sum two numbers, you would make this little comment at the top saying that this is the sum get request. And then you would have it say, add two numbers. That's step one. Step two is you tell Plumber to run that file. And in this case, I'm telling it to run it on port 80, which is like the standard browser port. And then step three is you can then already use the API. So if this was the commands you run, you could then go to 127.0.0.1, which is your home computer. And you could go slash sum A equals one and B equals two. And the API would compute that number for you and return it into the browser. Or you could just as easily use hitter and make that same style of request and get the response back. And so if you look at this, you might be like, well, that doesn't seem that useful. Like I can already run R code on my computer and get a response. Um, why do I care? about this. And it's like, well, now the R summation is happening in a different R session than your browser is running or your get hitter command is running. So you're actually having two isolated systems, um, which goes galaxy brain into the idea of microservices, which is right now software engineers and software developers, they have all these different computers and they're sending all these requests to each other. And if you're a data scientist, it's very annoying to say, okay, software engineers, here, take my R code and you figure out how to install the libraries and you figure out what file paths to use and you get it all running. That's annoying for software engineers. A much nicer thing is, is if you can wrap a plumber API around your model, then you can run the model somewhere on some computer. And you can say, software engineers, just connect to my compute my code when you need to ask for a model result. And so in this case, the software engineers never have to think about R. All they have to think about is sending you hit HTTP requests and getting the JSON back. And you can worry about hosting and all that stuff. Uh, so it's a really nice separation of concerns. And then you can suddenly use your R model. You can take any R model you make. You can put an API wrap around it with Plumber. And now you could put it in a production system. So now you can actually have it live somewhere and um, other software engineers can use it. So here's like what that means in practice for hosting a model. So let's say you train a model, you do some R markdown file that creates a model, you save the model somewhere. Your plumber API would probably be something like this. You would load your libraries like the tidyverse. You would then read the model in from somewhere that you trained earlier. Maybe you'd load some helper functions too from a script. And then you would have a like post make prediction endpoint. And so the post in the post request, you'll send all the customer attributes and that'll be the body of the request. And then you'll maybe use those helper functions to clean that up, to create the features. And then you actually feed that to your model to make your prediction. And then you set the result back. And this is basically the entire putting R in prod idea is just this, of just have a model loaded, make an endpoint to run that model, and then return the result. That said, even in this simple form, there are already some complexities. For instance, should the software developers send you all of the customer information to use to the run the model on, right? If you're doing a model for customers, like what movies to recommend, should the, should the engineers send you the, you know, their, their historical movies and the last time they last existed, like should they send you the features or should they just send you get us a prediction for customer 21 and then it's your job to go create a databases to get that data. Both of those are reasonable design decisions. You gotta just decide it. Um, 
where should that model be loaded from? Should it just be loaded from like a, a like your hard drive, or should you have that model like living in the cloud somewhere so other people can like pull it and you can do all sorts of like storage smart stuff of like backing it up? Um, and what about the diagnostics? You know, when you send a response back of like, hey, we recommend the movie Die Hard, should you send a confidence of like, oh, we know that this the model highly, you know, we think it's a highly likely that the person will click this, or literally do you just want to send the prediction? And these are kind of API design questions that end up being a lot of like communication with stakeholders on like, how should this particular model work? So you make your plumber thing. And earlier I just said, hey, you can run this and access it from your laptop. It's true, you can't yet connect it to other systems until you make one other change. And that change is in your plumber run underscore PR command, you can add a host of 0000. And by adding a host of 000, that says any traffic from outside your computer can access this too. So if a computer can make a connection to yours, it can use this Plumber API, which means, for instance, if you are at home, you can change your router to say, hey, when people access your IP address for your house, you can tell your router to forward it to your computer. And actually, anyone in the world will then be able to access your Plumber uh, API, even if it's running on your computer, which I have done before. And it's like a feeling of very like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm out in the world. Like, suddenly, it's, it's I don't know, it's like a very... It's like when astronauts are in outer space and they see the world and it looks so small. It's like, wow, I can run everything. This is just a tangent, but it's a really good point. Um, but here's the problem. If you did that with your API and you have it run on your uh, laptop and if anyone connects to it, uh, your problem is the moment your laptop runs out of battery or you close the lid, then your API stops working. And that is not good. You don't want to have your API rely on you having to leave your laptop open. So at some level, if you want to use Plumber, especially in a production system, you're going to want to have a computer continuously running somewhere to host this. But how would you do that? It turns out there are a lot of ways you can have a computer run a Plumber API for you. And I'm going to go through some of them. So the easiest way to do it is just manually set up a machine somewhere else. So this could literally mean just take a computer you have sitting around, put it in your closet, turn it on, leave it always running, and have your router and your house forward to that. I have run a computer that has had millions of hits on it and like on a website running this way. It works. It's better than you would expect of literally just put something in your closet, turn on a computer, install R on it, and then that becomes your plumber API that other people can hit. That can work. There are downsides, like if your power goes out or you have to pay the electricity bills, but whatever. It, it's a start. You could do the same thing, but instead of saying, hey, I'm going to use an old uh, computer from my, my closet, uh, instead, I would like to rent a computer from Amazon for money. And in which case you can do the exact same thing, but you go to AWS, you spin up an EC2 instance, you install R on it, you install Plumber on it, you put your code for your endpoints on it, and then you run that. And it's basically the same idea, but instead of it being in your closet, it is on the cloud. There are Docker-based methods. Um, so I'm not going to go deep into what Docker is, except it's great. But the basic idea is that with a Docker container and Docker images, you can like compile everything that's going to be on a computer into something called an image. And then you can take that image and you can have it run in all sorts of places. So like the, an image is like a nice, easy thing you can pass around and run in different ways. So Saturn Cloud has built-in deployments, which let you take images, add R code to them, and run them, which is pretty good. We also, there are tools like Google Cloud Run, which are very highly optimized to running Docker images uh, for APIs like this. Uh, excellent tool for this sort of thing. Or if you're really ambitious, you can install your own Kubernetes cluster somewhere and have your Docker containers run on that. Um, also, if you work with an engineering team, they're probably going to go this way. So you would make a Docker container for them, and then they would use Kubernetes, which is just a way of running Docker containers, and they would take it and be like, okay, we'll take your uh, Docker container and run it for you. There are also managed solutions. And the idea of a managed solution, I consider this a, hey, I don't want to think about anything besides R code. I really just want to think about R code. I don't want to think about Docker or we, you know, virtual images or anything. Like, just, just let me play in R. Um, there are two recommendations for that. There's R Studio Connect, which has a really nice button that you can press, like, publish uh, API, and then it hosts your API stuff for you. So you don't have to think about that stuff at all. Uh, DigitalOcean is another company that does that as well. So the point is, here's, that's what, seven options, and I've only listed some of them. There are even more available. So the point is, you have a lot of options on how you can deploy these things. I highly recommend trying out a couple. Um, and if you're using this in like a company setting, they're probably going to have opinions on what you should be doing too. I will just say, again, 30 seconds promo, if you want to do this on Saturn Cloud, we have a new deployment button. 
which will spin up an image. And then you can give it the plumber command, which is that plumber run in the rest controller file. And then you hit start and connect it to your Git code and it will run for you. That is the way to do it on Satter Cloud. You do not have to do it on Satter Cloud. Lots of those solutions I presented earlier are um, really good. Part two, making it enterprise ready. Okay, so we, we talked about some stuff. We talked about how APIs work. We talked about how Plumber works, which is the R version of hosting APIs. Um, and we talked about some ways to deploy it. Saturn Cloud, R Studio Connect, a, a laptop in your closet. There are all lots of different ways you can do these. But what if you actually want to make this enterprise ready? Meaning, no, really, you're actually wanting to use this at Netflix or you know, some company where you're expecting lots of traffic and you have engineers who want your code to work and don't want, you don't want to make them mad by having this code crash all the time or having issues. Like you really actually want to use this in like a real customer facing way. What are the things you have to do between getting started with Plumber and making it enterprise ready? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to, well, the first thing I'm going to do, because you guys are all on mute. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about ways you can make the code itself better to run in production. The first thing you want are unit tests. Oh my God, you so desperately want unit tests. What are unit tests? A unit test is just a very small piece of code that says, hey, I'm going to test that this scenario works on my API. So for instance, if we're doing a model, you know, movie recommendation model, and as input, it takes the customer's age. What happens if the age is missing? What happens if someone sent you a negative age? What happens in all these weird cases? Uh, we want to make sure the model handles them gracefully and doesn't just crash. Because if your model crashes, if the um, if your model crashes with ages missing, that could cause a real scenario in production where someone didn't upload their age and then your code breaks, which causes someone else's code to break and blah, blah, blah. So you really want to capture all these edge cases. Unit tests are great for that. There is a package in R called test that. And now test that, if you like read the docs and stuff, they're really highly targeting people who make R packages. The idea is you can add unit tests so that before you update your R package, your R package doesn't have any issues with it. But you can use unit test that just as easily for Plumber APIs as you could for a package. So what you do is you make a test, you make like a file called like testing.r and in it, you put all the tests you want to run. You know, what happens if it's missing the name, if it's missing the age, if, you know, their age is 10 million, whatever. Um, you put all your test case in and then you can run there, but you're asking yourself, but, but this is an API and it's like running on a server somewhere else. So like, how do I have my unit test here run over there? And it's all complicated. And it's actually not so complicated. My recommendation for unit tests with a API is you forget the plumber part, right? Because we have just a file called restcontroller.r that has functions in it that are being called when you use eight endpoints. We well, can use those functions in other ways too. So if you see here, the way when I use test that to test a plumber API, what I'll actually do is I'll use a list as the input to the function. And I will pass that to my make prediction function instead of calling that via plumber and all that. So the point is when you run unit tests, I recommend not worrying about the fact that it's an API and just calling are the calling all of the functions you made in R as functions in R and just like forget the plumber layer. Um, works pretty well in practice. Uh, things you really do want to test, you know, test all of the endpoints that your API has. You want to test like what happens if your, you know, your data has um, like is missing, if it's a negative, if it's all that kind of stuff. There's a don't here, which is it's very, if you're building a model and you're having an API that's a model, it's very enticing to want to put a unit test in of like, hey, if this person loves action movies, I want a unit test that says they have to get a recommendation of an action movie because they absolutely love uh, action movies. So the idea is you might want to, in your unit test, hard code some, well, in this very obvious data point should get this very obvious prediction. Beware of that because it's actually, you can imagine if you have like a thousand different potential customers, if just one of them gets a bad prediction, your code should still probably go to production. Like you shouldn't say, whoa, hold on, don't deploy this code. Like if that one person who loves action movies gets a romance, your model may overall be good. And like a unit test should really be a, whoa, hey, do not put this in prod. And so then you're like, well, maybe I can get it to some clever stuff where I'm gonna create a test case of a thousand customers. And if at least 990 get predictions I like, then I'll send it to prod, but it's like, ah, oh, but how accurate do those predictions have to be and blah, blah, blah. And this is just like a whole can of worms that you want to be careful about. So when you're making unit tests, just really think deeply about how you want to, um, how you want to, um, I lost my chain of thought, but here we are. How you want to test the unit tests around the actual model, like accuracy and stuff like that. So like, just be careful when you do it at the unit test layer. 
So another thing, okay, your code works. Even in the weird cases where you have an 10 million age, your code still works. But what happens if everyone tries to hit your code at once? What if 10 million customers all log in at the same time and all need predictions? Can your code handle that? Will you run out of memory? Will it just crash from the number of connections? These are all real things that happen all the time. And your favorite like launch of Disney Plus or new production systems probably fail these load tests. Um, so a load test is, a, hey, I want to make sure my API works, even if lots of things are using it at the same time. Um, so T-Mobile is doing a lot of stuff with R in production. And one thing that um, T-Mobile has is a package for R called load test. But actually, like if your API is running somewhere, you can turn on your laptop install the load test package, and then your laptop will hit that API 10 million times for you. And then the nice thing about that is because this is an R package, not only can you tell it, hey, hit the, hit the API 10 million times, but the response of like, well, what happened when we hit 10 million times is a nice data frame that is tidy and you can put into ggplots. Um, so this is a really nice way to just test if you have a production system, like, hey, is it gonna handle the load we expect? And you can look at graphs of like, well, like, do we, you know, how long does the average request take to respond? How long does the worst case, blah, 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 like all that kind of stuff. I and mean, that's pretty helpful and cool. Uh, here you can see just an example of load testing tmobile.com. So this would be like, well, what if two people were running, were, were using the website at the same time and they, they loaded the web page 10 times, what would happen? Uh, in practice, these probably should be like, the numbers would be like 200 and like a thousand or whatever, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so you load test your code. It seems to work well enough. Um, or if not, we can get to that later in a couple of slides. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna document your code. So you may, you're an R expert. You're listening to this. You're like, I am good at documenting my code. I've heard a million times I document my code and I'm gonna write, you know, hashtag comment, hash comment all throughout my code. But here's the problem. The standard way of documenting code is good for the people who are editing the code itself. But what about the people who are calling your API? Your API is going to have very specific requirements of like age has to be an integer or age can be a decimal. You know, it's going to have very specific requirements around what requests your API will listen to and what it will respond back with. And engineers need to know exactly what they're going to send you and exactly what to get back. And so you want to write a document that tells exactly those things. And the good news is, is there is a format of writing for exactly how you write what an API should send and receive. And that is called an open API doc or a swagger doc. Um, and these documents you can see on the right, this is a example of one of those. And it's like actually way longer, but example of saying, okay, it's gonna have one endpoint called pets. It's gonna accept get requests. It's gonna take a parameter called limit. And this is a very well formatted spec so that if you write a swagger doc, then not only can other humans read it and understand what your API is supposed to do, but also other computers can process it and know what to expect as well. So it's like a very nice open format. The problem with these things is they're really long and they're a huge hassle to write just because there's so many things you have to specify. What's the minimum size of this number that can be? What's the maximum size number? Blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's a huge hassle. The good news is, is that Plumber has built in the ability to look at your like rest.controller file and say what the Swagger doc should look like. So when anytime you actually start running a Plumber file, you'll notice it actually tells you two things. One, where the API is running, and it'll also tell you how to read the docs on it. So that docs is actually the open API spec. Um, the underscore, underscore docs, underscore, underscore is like a nice interactive UI web page. but you could also just do slash open API.json to literally get this YAML file. And once you have that, you can edit it. You know, it's like Plumber isn't perfect at guessing what it should actually be, but it's pretty good. And you can use that as your starting point for, um, you know, fully documenting exactly what your API should be doing. Um, so this is really important to making something enterprise ready because without this document, no one will know how to actually use your API. And then lastly, I would say on the code side, you really want to manage your dependencies. Cause let's say, oh no, you're running it in your closet and your computer died and you lost your hard drive, or you accidentally delete your EC2 instance or whatever. And you say, okay, now I need to reinstall R and restall all the packages. But like, what packages did you install? Do you remember? Do you remember which weird Linux libraries you installed? Do you remember which versions of packages you installed? And if the answer is no, you could absolutely run into a scenario where you install like a newer version of dplyr and now your code doesn't work anymore. And that's really bad because you don't want to run into a situation where if something goes down, the time it goes up, you can't actually get it back up again because you don't know what things to have installed on it. There are a bunch of ways that you can manage these sorts of dependencies of keeping track of what particular things were installed. 
So when Docker images, and I'm not, again, not gonna go into super detail, but like a Docker image is a solution to this because when you build a Docker image, it like encapsulate exactly what is gonna be on the computer that's running. So it will capture what packages were there. So you can always just build, start a new system with the same Docker image and you're basically fine. So that's a good step. Um, there's also Microsoft RAN um, and the RStudio package manager. And these are systems you can use that are, um, you know, you can imagine if you're right, if you install dplyr, you don't know which like date of dplyr, like what version of dplyr you do. And these two systems actually let you like lock in a date. So you can say, I want to install whatever the latest version of dplyr was on January 1st, 2022. And by doing this, you have now fully specified exactly what version of every part R package you're using. Um, so this is a really valuable um, system to do. And our studio package manager, you can like install for your enterprise and you can like manage other like Git projects with it. It's like, it's a pretty good system. So these are generally good things to do if you're putting R in production specifically. Also specifically, if you're putting R into production, the RNV package uh, is good for managing which versions of packages were installed when your code is running. Uh, so that's very helpful. But again, it's only on the R side. So things like which Linux libraries we're using, which version of Debian or Ubuntu we're using, like that kind of stuff can get lost when you're using R specific technologies. Uh, lastly, in Saturn Cloud Recipes, when you deploy things to Saturn Cloud, you can keep track of what was deployed at that time as well through our special JSON files. Um, so that's just another layer. And there are lots of layers here that you can use to manage your dependencies. Um, lots of them, th these ways of storing things are good. And it really depends on like your particular company's enterprise environment for which sort of approach you want to take. Okay. So that was ways you can make your code better. So if you followed all those steps, you have unit tests, you have load tests on your code, you have dependency management, you have blah, blah, blah. But what about like actually running the like Plumber API itself? How can we make the infrastructure around this API better, right? Like more than just running an API, what else can we add to this to really like make it enterprise good? So the first thing you probably want to do is add a build process, right? So if, right, if you are running a computer in your closet with your Plumber API, every time you come out with a new version of your API, You'll have to like remote desktop into your computer or in like download a zip file and put in the latest stuff. And that's a very manual process. So a build, like you can create instead build processes so that every time you add a new commit to Git, like every time you update your Git repo, it will automatically rebuild it. Meaning it'll like take all of your packages, install the library, zip it all up, run the unit tests even, and actually do all that building for you and then deploy it of automatically downloading it to your, your um, closet computer or you know, upload it to the EC2 instance or deploy it to Docker. And these are called CI CD pipelines and these are generally good. And it makes it so you don't have to keep track of like, well, what's running on the server right now? Because generally it's like one particular branch of your Git repo is what's actively being deployed. So the first thing you can do is you can actually create this build process so that your dev environment and your Plumber API have some consistency and some good uh, record keeping. And it doesn't have to be manual. Okay, what's next? Another thing you might want to do is scale it up. So if you fail your load tests and it turns out, hey, we need to actually handle a lot of load, you can do things to, to one, you can deploy more concurrent plumber APIs. So if, you're, if you have an R model that predicts movie recommendations, instead of just running one API on one computer, you could have 10 computers each having the same API. And if you have 10 computers with the same API, you can have an 11th computer whose job it is to just randomly pick each server to send the re request to. So then each, re each one of those uh, servers has one tenth the load. So instead of having a single server, you can have a bunch of servers all running concurrently. This is what like Kubernetes is all about of just like automatically scaling these things up. The idea is you can have a lot of plumbers uh, APIs running. And ideally if you have a software engineering team, they can manage this stuff for you. But that, that is one way to scale things up. At the same time, you can also still, if you're running into load test problems, you can make your code more efficient. So newer versions of Plumber now have the ability. So on older versions of Plumber, uh, they used to be that you could only handle one request at a time. So if you have an API and 10 people are trying to hit it, you have to wait until all nine of them are done before the 10th person gets a response. The newer versions of Plumber actually let you do things in parallel. So you can have, um, if you have 10 people, um, trying to hit your API at the same time, Plumber will spawn 10 R processes for you and have them all run concurrently to make things 10 times faster. Um, the way you would do that is you can use the future package and you add a, basically a future object to your Plumber API. And now you've added parallelization, which will speed things up. Um, but even with this, you will probably still hit a point where you're like, man, I really wish instead of having one computer running Plumber at the same time, I had two or 10 or 100. Um, 
Right. Okay. So you're like, okay, next step was we're going to add more servers to make this thing run even faster and more at scale. And we don't worry about a bunch of customers taking it down. All right, cool. What's next? Well, you probably want to keep track of things, right? Every time your model runs, you probably want to know two things. One, if your, cust if your model recommended that customer watch an action movie, you probably want to have your model store somewhere that that customer asked for a recommendation and got the recommendation of action movie. This is useful both for like debugging, like to understand what's going on, but it's also useful because you can train a new model on that data later. So you really want to stay, save that sort of results somewhere. Um, you also probably just want to monitor the usage and the performance. So like even forgetting what the actual prediction was, you probably want to keep a log of like, well, how often are, are, is this endpoint being hit or like lots of people using it? And did it ever have any errors? Like did it ever spit out, hey, I don't know how to make a prediction for this type of customer. Um, so you probably want to do both of those things. So those are kind of different concepts of like saving the results in like an in like a, a big cloud bucket somewhere, saving like the like a tons of data for the results and saving the very like text based. This was a request on this date and it succeeded or failed. Um, so those are generally in an enterprise setting considered two different things like storing results versus logging. That means you need two databases to sort of set that up. Um, so when you're storing results that typically uses like AWS S3 or like the like cloud buckets, the log storage use tools like Splunk, which are enterprise tools that kind of just manage lots of logs. And so in that make prediction function from before that we were calling as an endpoint, you, you probably want to have a log in there saying, here's the, uh, here's the, here's what happened. Someone made a request and it succeeded or failed. And you also want to have some sort of saving component of like, and we're going to save the results somewhere. Um, so, okay. Now we got more systems. We have the dev environment, we have the Plumber API server, we have two databases to store both results and logs. Now it's starting to get, starting to feel a little more enterprise in here. But then you're like, okay, here's another thing we should be doing, right? Is your model is over time. You know, over time, your model was trained on one particular data set and over time that's gonna get outdated. And you probably wanna like be aware if your model starts to give out bad recommendations, you notice it. And now you can't always, tell if a recommendation was, or like a model result were good or bad. If you're doing some sort of like unsupervised learning where you're just like clustering customers into groups, there's not necessarily a concept of right or wrong. But if you are doing something like where you can tell if a user clicked on the recommendation you gave or not, you probably wanna have a system in place there that will monitor, you know, you want some method of monitoring, hey, are these recommendations good? The simple thing to do is just hire a data scientist and tell them, hey, once a month, run an R markdown report on all the result data just to make sure it's accurate or not. And that goes a long way. And I, I recommend just having a data scientist manually do things for a while. But eventually you may want to say, hey, we should automatically be checking. And if, you know, if there's ever a week where less than 95% of the recommendations are good, that's kind of absurd, less than half the recommendations are good, um, we should send an email to someone somewhere. So now you have an additional system. And this performance check system, what it's going to do is like on a schedule, once a week or once a day or once a month, it's going to load up the results. It's going to tell if the results are good or not. And if they're good or bad, it's going to like send you a Slack message or an email or something. Um, so now we're starting to have a lot of interconnected systems here. Um, but if you'll notice, if that model is getting, like if that model really gives out bad results, at some point, you're probably going to be like, okay, we need to retrain this model. Like, hey, the model doesn't take into account that we merge, you know, that that Netflix merged, merged with Hulu. So now all the customers are different or something. So like, we need to now retrain our model. So you're like, okay, let's retrain the, the model. So now the plumber API is not using an old model, but now it's going to be using a new model instead, which means you need to start versioning your models, which means you need to keep track of this is the model that ran between these days. And this is the model that's running right now. And you want to keep track of which days the model is running on because you want to look at the historic data and be able to tell which model gave which recommendation. Um, you can't just like save models to a Git repo because models tend to be big and Git repos can't handle that. Like you need a more clever way of doing it. Um, so like probably want some cloud bucket like AWS S3 or something like that to like store models in there. Um, uh, you also probably are going to run into even more trouble if the features themselves are changing, right? Like if a newer version of a model has a new feature of like customers, like, I don't know, like derived coolness level, like if that's a feature that your model has, um, you need a way of not only keeping track of the models, but which versions of your code can load that version of the model because your code like passes the right features to it. Um, the R Studio is creating, working on it. They're starting to release a new package for managing your versions. And I can't for the life of me, I, pronounce it correctly, I don't know. But 
they're working on the space and that's another particular system. Um, there are other tools as well that are out there like um, ML flow to kind of keep track of models and things like that. There, there are a fair number of systems for this. Um, having more structure around your systems is good. Having just an S3 bucket with models in it is still better than nothing. Like, like this is actually a pretty important and good thing to um, keep track of over time. Um, and then you're like, okay, but here's the one that gets me. You're like, oh, this system isn't quite complicated enough. If you talk to people who work in the ML ops space, everything, all they talk about is models automatically retraining. They're like, oh, your model, but how does your model retrain? How does it automatically retrain, blah, blah, blah. So then you're like, okay, you know, like 80%, like 90% of the time people do machine learning. You could train a model once every three months and that's fine. And retrain it every three months, it's fine, right? Like if you're doing a model that just predicts if a customer is going to churn or not, like customers don't change that much that every week suddenly your model has to retrain. So most of the time, I think MLOps people are just trying to make some bucks by being like, well, how are you going to set up your auto, your, your retraining? Um, but I do think there are some occasions, like if you think of Google's recommendations engines, it needs to update constantly because as new news comes out, the recommendations should change. So there are times where you want to automatically retrain, which means you now need a system that listen, looks at your model store, looks at your results, and will take the results generate a new model, save it to the store. But this model retraining itself could be an API. And so now suddenly we have all of the complexity of all this other stuff, like the logs, the results, blah, blah, blah. You need that around the retraining system. So your computer that loads up the historic data, trains a model and saves it. So now instead of our API returning like predictions, it's returning trained models. And now we have to have a whole another set of infrastructure on this. So the point is like the auto retraining, now you're really talking about a lot of complexity because like what happens if your auto retraining goes bad and the model that gets deployed is bad and your customers get bad recommendations. Not only do you need some way of noticing that the model suddenly got bad, you need some way of rolling back to an earlier model and you need some way of scrubbing the data because all of the customers getting bad recommendations messed up the data set you're gonna use the next time you retrain the model, which is a real problem that happens to people. So this is an enormous amount of complexity. And if you're looking here, you're like, wow, this sure feels like a lot of systems to put into enterprise. And it's like, yes, this is a crazy amount of stuff to put in enterprise. And then you're probably as a data scientist thinking, well, I could never do that, could I? And the answer is, I assure you, most of the time you don't need every single one of these things in the fancy version all the time. So this is like my heartfelt message to you, person watching this, which is you may hear machine learning engineers talk about like all the fancy things that have to go on. And like at some level, you do wanna store the logs and you do wanna retrain it automatically and blah, blah, blah. But you don't have to do all those things at once. You don't have to do those things at the start. And you can really incrementally build, like just as my kind of slides like, it, like started out, you could start with an API that's running in your closet. And then you could switch it to a cloud and they switch it to Docker. And then you add logs and then you add storing models and blah, blah, blah. Like nothing has to happen in a day. This really can be a slow process that your team iterates on the whole time. And I strongly encourage you, if you're a data scientist watching this and you haven't really done plumber API development or like enterprise production, like just start small and work your way up. Don't feel like because you don't know how to handle all the big stuff, you can't like get started. Cause like getting started is definitely the hardest part. So to recap, um, here are my notes. I do, even though that last slide's kind of got nuts, I do think creating a production API is easy and fun. If you just think of an API as sending HTTP requests or receiving HTTP requests, just like a website, just like a Shiny app, it's not like a very complex topic. And it's, R already has a package built it, you know, uh, there available that can help you with this um, in like a nice, easy R way. So you just only have to reason about R. And you can run Plumber everywhere. You can run on your laptop. You can run in the cloud. You can run in your closet. Um, eventually, you're going to want to have it running on a computer. You know it's going to be up all the time. But like, you can really start small on this. Um, and I will actually add to the point. Not only can you start small, there's also lots of fun side projects you can do with these, right? Like you can make uh, like I've made an API that the Slack app went with, you know, worked with. So if you typed in something in Slack, it hit the API and then returned a picture of my kid or something like. Um, those are the sorts of small fun things you can do with APIs and fraud. And it's like, it's cool. It's fun. I highly recommend learning this stuff. Um, and then if you're like, okay, I'm starting to get it. I'm going to deploy in more places. You can deploy these in virtual machines, Docker containers, Saturn cloud, um, our studio connect, um, for really one click deployment stuff. Um, so there are lots of places you can run these and they're all, uh, they're all good. It's all good just to try stuff. And then it's like, okay, but really what if I want to put this in an enterprise production that millions of customers are talk looking at it a day? Um, how would I do that? Um, well, to recap, the things you want to add 
are unit tests, load tests, code that runs under stress. So like actually scale up your code appropriately, document things with an API spec, write logs, store results, monitor the performance, version your models, maybe even automate the retraining. And if you look here, you'd be like, wow, that's a lot of steps. Do I really have to do all these things as a data scientist? And I'm like, good news. This stuff, you may not think it's fun, but there is a world of people who love doing these kinds of stuff and they're called machine learning engineers. So if you're a data scientist and you want to deploy something to prod and you don't want to have to think about all of these things, make friends with the machine learning engineers. They love doing this stuff. They love thinking about scale. They love versioning um, and like getting a good relationship with the ML engineer um, at your company or things like that can really help you if you want to have help put things in prod without having to deal with every single one of these things on your own. Um, if you would like to know more, I have some recommendations. This actually, like, there's a lot out here that can help you. Um, so I tried my hardest to whittle it down to just a few things. Um, one, on Saturn Cloud, you can deploy Plumber. So if you just like, I would like to deploy something that's not on a machine running in my closet, we have some examples of how you can do it in Saturn Cloud. If you're like, I'd like to learn more about enterprise deployments. So I've got two R Studio talks both of which I was in. Um, so one was with me and Heather Knowles at T-Mobile because most of the stuff I talk about in the presentation, they are doing at T-Mobile where they hit uh, our a million times a day and it's really cool. So me and Heather in 2019, um, me and Heather Knowles gave a talk on deploying R to production there. And then 2020, we made a follow-up. So we're hitting R a million times a day. So we made a talk about it. Um, these are just two talks that again, like link to more resources and things like that. of just like how you can think about these things a little bit more concretely. Um, and if you thought this talk was interesting and fun, uh, one, thank you. Um, but two, we also, in two weeks uh, at Saturn Cloud, we we're doing a webinar with um, Ian Stokes-Reese from BCG Gamma, um, where we're gonna talk about like data science leadership and how you should run teams and all that kind of stuff too. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out.